Keep it an experiment that I thought as of the people who think and do it. The sort of unwritten rule of the house is that you have an hour for, for presentation and then you have an hour for discussion and then we can continue in an informal manner for a, a past beer somewhere. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Donna, for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here in what has, I think, in common. Uh, not only the center of Bacolianism, or the study of Bacolianism, but also very much a center for the study of Della Porta. So I'm quite, <laughs> I'm quite interested to have your comments on what in principle is. It's very much work in progress. Uh, I mean, I've worked in Della Porta um, in the past, and so recently kind of pushed um, by Ariana Borelli, I've kind of returned to this uh, material uh, on Della Porta and the work on Della Porta, which I had left for, uh, for several years. Now, from a somewhat different perspective, uh, doing uh, quite a bit of work in the meantime at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science on, uh, on recipes and, and secrets, and very much looking through those glasses again at uh, Della Porta's uh, Book of Secrets and Natural Magic. So, in the paper, I'm primarily concerned with uh, Della Porta's Magia Naturalis. The first edition, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, appeared in 1558, was translated in multiple languages, then expanded in a second edition, uh, published in 1589, and again translated in uh, several languages. Uh, book 17 of the 1589 edition, which is the one to, uh, which is probably the best known, or at least is the one that the stories of optics, who have primarily dealt with Della Porta, uh, would traditionally turn to, appeared within this context of a book of secrets whose success, fame, and readership was perhaps only matched by the secrets of Alessio Piemontese. Before the publication of the Refractione in 1593, which followed uh, a much more in a much more straightforward way. The format of a book on mixed mathematics, Della Porta's work on optics was structured and organized in typical ways, emerging in the culture of knowledge and print discussed by William Eamon. My point in this talk is to take the structure of the Book of Secrets seriously and to show how this structure shaped the organization of experiential optical knowledge, the concept of experience, as well as the experience of the reader of optical secrets and knowledge. And the point I want to make has, I hope, relevance and significance beyond Della Porta and optics. Following the work of William Eamon in recent years, excellent work has been done arguing that the popularization of the tradition of secret speaking in the 16th century, that the groundwork for the empirical culture in 17th and 18th century scientific practice. Implicitly or explicitly, this work endorses the Kuhnian distinction between a mathematical and experimental tradition in early modern science and associates 16th century books of secrets primarily with the development of Baconian sciences, or so called Baconian sciences, like chemistry, meteorology, and magnetism. I consider the paper as a contribution to our understanding of the impact of books of secrets in the mathematical sciences and explores a still little understood shared experimentalism in natural magic and mathematics. Dana Yanoviano, uh, together with Cesare Pastorino, have recently argued that, quote, this new experimentalism permitted even traditionally bookish disciplines such as natural history, which became in the writings of Francis Bacon experimental, collaborative, and practically oriented. They point to Bacon's posthumously published uh, Silva Silvarum, which, like Della Porta's Magia Naturalis, was a vast collection of miscellaneous experiments ranging from distillations to crossbreeding and from the making of gold to talking hats. In fact, Dan Garb has shown that quite a few of Bacon's experiments are taken from Della Porta's Magia Naturalis and placed in a different methodological and theoretical context. So I will argue here that in this grand in this groundbreaking work on optics, Paulipomena at Vitalionem, Johannes Kepler similarly used Della Porta's Magia Naturalis as a source book of experiments. And so that I hope will bring out in what ways the tradition 
of books of secrets shaped experiential knowledge in optics. The talk will fall apart in, in three sections. In part one, I will briefly situate Delaportis Magia Naturalis within the long tradition of recipes in the way of printed books of secrets in the 16th century. In part two, I'll focus on Delaporta's sources and on how he appropriated these sources. Uh, although the book is presented as a series of experiments and secrets, the Magia Naturalis is based on a diversity of written sources in print and manuscript, which Delaporta extracted and transformed into separately identifiable units. That's what the secrets are. And finally, in part three, I will argue that Delaporte's transformation of his written sources, resulting from his reading practices, made it possible that his book was read as a source book of experiments in the 17th century, and I'm turning to the case of Kaplan. Now, recipes are probably as old as mankind's writing abilities. So we have, as you see here, clay tablets inscribed with Babylonian glass recipes. We also have the so-called Leiden and Stockholm Papari, which contain recipes for several arts and crafts, and which have a long after history reaching into the early modern period. By this time, recipes were ubiquitous. Recipes that appeared in print in 16th century and books of secrets often had a prehistory in manuscript collections of recipes. Manuscript and print um, were and remained coexistent traditions. And one point, I think, to make about these recipes and secrets is their longevity. So you would often find the very same secret that you would see in uh, the uh, Leiden or Stockholm Bapari. You would still find it, for example, in the 16th century so-called Bolognese manuscript. Avidly collected in manuscript notebooks and publicized in books of secrets flooding the print market, these recipes instructed readers how to color glass, make gold, and brew medicine. A good part of the late medieval and early modern recipes that have come down to us indeed concern medicine and the visual and decorative uh, arts, or what we would now call the visual and decorative arts. And in that category, Cianino Cianino's Libro dell'Arte is one of the more well-known collections, whose fame is probably only matched by the recipes and workshop secrets, which the physician Theodore de Mayenne compiled on the basis of conservations with Rubens, Van Dyck, and the like. However, these collections are uh, exceptions. These famous examples, connected with the name of their author or compiler, are only um, the tip of the iceberg. Hundreds of mostly anonymous collections of taken altogether thousands of recipes hide beneath the water surface. The most famous examples, like Cellini's, are also exceptional in the sense that they are all on one topic. Uh, the second point to make about these recipes is that the more typical collection of recipes is miscellaneous. The organization of Della Porta's Magia Naturalis, where amidst the secrets of all kinds of unproductive knowledge, we also find optical secrets revealing, for example, how to make a burning mirror uh, how to project an image in the air is also found in collections of recipes prior and contemporaneous to Delaporte's Book of Secrets. For example, this uh, mid 16th century uh, manuscript collection of recipes brought together by the Antwerp apothecary Peter van Kaldenberg, and you can probably just about make out its name there on top of the binding. Um, so this collection of recipes is very similar in content and organization to books of secrets published in the same period. Partly written in Latin and partly in Dutch, the recipes in Latin are most diverse in nature, dealing with cooking, medicine, alchemy, and the making of glass and colors. While the longer Dutch part contains recipes which are mostly of art technological origin, the making of colors in different media, inks, glass making, and amidst this section on glass making, also optical secrets, that is, recipes for the construction of mirrors. Now, long before Delaportis Magia Naturalis, collections of recipes and secrets were vehicles for the transmission of optical knowledge. The most, um, this is most tellingly uh, the case for the numerously circulating copies of the Secretum Philosophorum, 
which contains uh, also, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, optical secrets. The Secretum Philosophorum was originally composed in England in the late 13th or early 14th century. Devoted to the seven liberal arts, it was nevertheless more than just another university textbook. Uh, for example, the first section on grammar consisted of recipes explaining how to construct a pen and how to make ings, and the third section on dialectic listed secrets on how to deceive the senses including some on how to deceive the sense of sight. More strongly organized according to the scheme of the liberal arts than most recipe collections, it's, it's typically nevertheless um, miscellaneous. <coughs> so I want to make three uh, points about books of secrets on the basis of the example of the Secretum Philosophorum. And the first point is about ambiguity of meaning. I'll do that with one example. This is one secret, and so it's about to make a mirror in which many moving images will appear in a single place. And I actually, I'll read through it to actually give you a sense of what uh, uh, such a secret, what it, what it actually looks like and how it's, uh, or what the language is like. You can also make a mirror in which in one glance many moving images will appear, and this is how it is done. Take a very deep box and place in the bottom of it an ordinary mirror that is a convex one. Next take six or seven other convex mirrors of the same size and scrape off with a knife their lap which is on the concave side. But you should know that it is very difficult to scrape off all the lap cleanly without breaking the glass. So if you want to clean the mirror as well and remove the lap, take some quicksilver and rub the lap with it. And straight away it will adhere to the line and penetrate it, so that after a little time you can easily remove the lap completely from the mirror. Now, when they are very clean, put them in a box, but in such a way that they stand a slant in the mirror, and moreover in different positions, which you will do thus. When the first mirror has been placed in the bottom, you will place the second mirror so that one side is attached to the first mirror, and the opposite side is distant from it by one finger. And in this way, you will put the other mirrors in the box, but in different positions. But on, top, on the top surface of the box, you will put a mirror, which has been cleaned as above, straight and not a slant, and then adjust them well, so that only the topmost mirror is seen. Now, if you look into the mirror, you will see as many images as there are mirrors. But if you turn the mirror, you will see how one image always stays in the middle and in one position, and the other images come to me as if they were doing a dance. So the secret describes two different processes. Uh, how to make glass mirrors, starting from what at the time, and basically up to the 16th century, were the more common convex mirrors. And then the second process is how to assemble the mirrors in such a way, specifying distances and positions of the respective mirrors, as to create partic a particular optical effect in these dancing images. Uh, now, depending upon uh, our interpretation of position and distances, there seems to be, at first glance, more than one way to, um, to put this together, or to put that optical instrument together. And while it is possible to reconstruct an optical object from this text, believe me, you just have to believe me, we've tried this, so we've actually animated it, uh, so you can actually see the images dance, at least in one possible interpretation. I think ambiguity, the point here is that ambiguity of meaning is the rule in books of secrets. And this ambiguity is typically enhanced by the, uh, what is equally typical, the absence of diagrams or drawings of instrument designs. So I think we all have confronted with something like this, uh, something like, for God's sake, just give us the drawing, and uh, there typically there never is. Mm -hmm. A second point I want to make um, is about transmission. Not only did secrets travel as part of the Secretum Philosophorum, they also traveled independently. And in this process of transmission, the secrets were reorganized and appeared in different contexts. For example, Jean Fusori was an early 15th century mathematician and instrument maker based in Paris. He also showed an interest in optics, in particular in burning mirrors. 
and more generally, as his annotations to Wittelow's perspective and other notes show, catoptrics and image formation. His manuscript on burning mirrors, a variation on the Libellus Amorchesi Compositio, which is now in the uh, Bibliothèque Municipale in Dijon, also contains a note on, a quote, how to make a mirror in which many moving images of one object appear, which is, in fact, taken from uh, the Secret and Philosophy Forum. And so, in short, optical secrets from the Secret and Philosophy Forum traveled independently and were combined with, for example, a treatise on burning mirrors. A third and final point, secrets um, packaged at, uh, optical knowledge as how to, and this engaged the reader in trying and testing uh, the experiments. For example, one reader to a 16th century copy of the Secretum Philosophorum questioned the procedures to turn a convex mirror into a glass sphere, and actually also left notes to his doubts in the margin. And if you read these notes, you get, yes, exactly, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, which apparently they were already in the 16th century were trying out uh, a recipe like this. Okay. So let me now turn to uh, uh, Delaporte's natural magic. Delaporte's optical secrets often are the products of reading experiences copied from other sources. And I will um, look at three examples of secrets mm. to investigate the kind of transformations these sources undergo in the process of appropriation. The first example is Della Porta's secret of how to draw a parabolic section given the focal distance and the making of a parabolic burning mirror. And this secret is taken from Orange Finet's De Spicru Ostorio, a book bringing together technical and mathematical knowledge of mirrors. Della Porta probably knew this book through its publication in 1587 as an appendix to Cosimo Bartoli's translation of Finet's Protomatesis in an Italian translation by Ercole Bottrigaro, a Bolognese humanist who had also edited Ptolemy's uh, geography. And the Laporte's secret was taken, in fact, almost verbatim from Propositions uh, 8 and 9 from Finet's uh, uh, Bispicolo Storia. In fact, um, it's been shown that Laporte borrowed the diagrams of Bispicolo Storia as well as Finet's mistakes, um, so the mistakes in, in the proposition Teleporter just takes over the uh, mistakes using exactly also the same language and the same construction, which is problematic. However, although Teleporter's secret is taken from a textual source, his appropriation took place in a context of making. Teleporter collaborated on the construction of a parabolic burning mirror with Giacomo Contarini, the provveditore of the arsenal in Venice, and a collector of books, manuscripts, and instruments. In 1580, Della Porta's patron, Cardinal Deste, sent him to Venice to make or obtain a parabolic burning mirror. Looking for guidance to construct a parabolic burning mirror, uh, Della Porta turned to Giacomo Contarini, presumably not only to provide the means, but also the skills. So on the 29th of November 1580, Della Porta wrote to his patron that Contarini had spent the day and most of the night at the arsenal with him supervising an attempt by one of the arsenal craftsmen to cast a parabolic mirror. More importantly, it was even through the network of Contarini that Della Porta encountered Oran's Fiend's work on burning mirrors. And it's through these same networks that Della Porta also came across the work of the Venetian mathematician Etto Bessonio. When Della Porta visited Venice in 1580, to attend the construction of a parabolic mirror, he also met Paolo Sarpi, who may already have been aware of his own theorical speaker on Capri Sferici, he later copied himself. And I'll just give a few examples of Della Porta's optical secrets, which uh, most likely have their source in uh, his reading of Rizzonio. First, Porta's secrets of how using a plain mirror uh, quote, letters may be cast out and wrapped on a wall that is far distant. Uh, it goes like this. On the superficies of a plain glass, make letters with black ink <coughs> and with wax, that they may be solid to hinder the light of the glass and shadow it. Then hold the glass against the sunbeam so that the beams reflecting on the glass may be cast upon the opposite wall of a chamber. It is no doubt that the light and letters will be seen in the chamber. Zonios Theorica, which you've just seen a manuscript copied by Galileo Galilei, 
already proposed to project lattice on a distant wall by means of a mirror and solar light. Second, Ozonius' secrets of how to use candlelight to read letters in an otherwise dark room was taken up by Della Porta, who specified that it should be done by placing a candle in the focal point of the mirror. So take the glass in your hand and set a candle to the point of inversion, for the parallel beams will be reflected to the place desired, and the place will be enlightened about 60 paces. And whatsoever falls between the parallels will be clearly seen. The reason is because the beams from the center to the circumference are reflected parallel. And when the parallels come to a point and in, this, in the place this illuminated, letters may be read and all things done conveniently that require a light. A third and final example, Della Porta's secret of how to kindle fire. In a concave spherical glass, the beams meeting together kindle fire in a fourth part of the diameter under the center, which are directed within the site of a hexagon from the superficies of the circle. And also this secret, and especially the locus of the focal point of a concave spherical mirror at the fourth part of the diameter of the mirror, is taken from a zone. So there's quite, there's quite a bit of optical knowledge that's actually packaged into this, into the secrets, some of it, which is in fact, uh, I can't give you the full story of that little story about this, which is very innovative you know, at the time. A third example of appropriation uh, concerns the secrets of, uh, or the secret of images in the air. Uh, Della Porta taught how to see an image hanging in the air with a convex lens. Uh, and the secret goes like this, if you place the visible object behind the lens so that it goes through the center of the lens but opposite to the eyes, you will see an image between the lens and the eyes. If you will place a piece of paper in the way, you will see clearly that a lighted candle appears to be burning upon the paper. And then, I think three chapters later, uh, Della Porta tells how to make an image appear in the air with a crystal ball. In front of and behind the lens, an image is shown hanging in the air. If the visible object is behind the ball, an image will appear outside, hanging in the air, above the ball, with all its parts separated from the ball, clearly and perspicuously. And the Laporte secrets are really variations on the secret of how to make a mirror to make an image float in the air, already found in the Secretum Philosophorum. Uh, which goes like, you can also make a mirror out of a convex mirror in which an image will appear outside. And this is how it is done. Take an ordinary mirror, so that is a convex one, and scrape off the lead and put it in a box which is not too deep, so that the convexity is towards the bottom of the box, and the concavity is outwards. Then put something dark between the bottom of the box and the mirror, such as the black cloth or some such thing, and do this so that the visual ray is better reflected. And if you attentively gaze in the mirror, you will see your image outside the box, in the air between you and the mirror. So try. The secret has its source in Whitlow's Perspectiva, but traveled widely and independently also outside the context of the Secret and Philosophorum in the 15th and 16th centuries. In fact, the ambiguous concept of image in the air is a good example of a notion which gained a life of its own without the constraints uh, imposed by Whitlow's Perspectiva and other optical uh, texts. And this ambiguity and flexibility of meaning is a consequence of the decontextualization following the process of copying, breaking up, and rewriting more rationally ordered optical source texts as standalone secrets. In 16th century books of secrets, the context which constrained the meaning of concepts and terms disappeared, leaving the reader with a wider field of interpretation and also room for creative misunderstandings. The images in the air are an expression of the 16th century confusion about the ontological status of the images formed in concave mirrors, convex lenses, and crystal balls. That is a confusion between projected images or experimentally produced images by light in the focal plane of a concave mirror or convex lens, which were alien to the conceptual framework of the perspectivist tradition of optics, and perceived images, images uh, as perceived by the eye in a mirror or lens. 
And it was this confusion Kepler tackled and tried to solve in Paralipomena. Kepler took his experiments with crystal balls from De La Porta. However, as a mathematician and natural philosopher, he had a different agenda from De La Porta, and he was therefore left unsatisfied with the confusion De La Porta embraced. However, in the same process of appropriation, Kepler turned the secrets into common experiences, uh, experimenta fugae, according to um, uh, Kepler's text. In the introduction to Harmonices Mundi, Kepler stated that he was not a geometer working on natural philosophy, but a natural philosopher working on this part of geometry. And Kepler unequivocally expressed here the ambition of his work as that of a natural philosopher, not that of a mathematician. The difference between the work of a mathematician and that of a natural philosopher was not one of degrees, uh, but one of kinds. Unlike the geometer, the philosopher is free to question his basic assumptions to the field as common and as different. Kepler's aim to develop the celestial physics is widely recognized as the most important characteristic of his astronomical work. Kepler saw his work in astronomy as part of natural philosophy, not as the work of a mere mathematician, in that his aim was to go beyond mere geometry to found the science of astronomy on true natural principles. And I've argued elsewhere that Kepler made the same intellectual move in optics. Um, what I've argued is that in his work on optics, Kepler saw himself not as a mathematician, but to paraphrase his own description in Harmonicus Mundi, as a natural philosopher working on this part of geometry, optics. But while Kepler considered his own work in optics natural philosophy, he appropriated optical experiments from the field of optics as practical and mixed mathematics. And he demanded that these experiments would make sense within his new physics of light. More specifically, it's possible to portray um, Kepler's theory of optical imagery as a natural philosophical appropriation of an innovative model of image formation developed in the 16th century practical and mixed mathematical tra uh, tradition, which was not interested in questioning philosophical assumptions on the nature of light. And I'll just give you uh, some background to that, some 16th century background, uh, which I've actually uh, talked and discussed elsewhere, which I think which is, which is absolutely crucial to understand what Kepler's move is actually all about, and where the difference between his work as a mathematician and a natural philosopher actually is. So for 16th century mathematicians, what is interesting to look at from Kepler's perspective is the circle of Petrus Ramos and his students, uh, Jean Pena and Friedrich Rizner. Uh, it would be very hard to overestimate the contribution of the humanist and educational reform of Petrus Ramos to 16th century optics. In particular, the years following Ramos' appointment to the Regius Professorship of Eloquency and Philosophy at the Collège Royal in 1551 were highly important in this respect. In those years, Ramos plan of a corpus matiseos, an ambitious publication program of editions and translations of ancient mathematical works was first formulated, partly realized thanks to the efforts of Jean Pena. In 1557, he published Euclid's uh, Rudimenta Mugisis, and more importantly, Optica et Catoptrica, the Greek text and first Latin translation of optics and catoptrics, then both considered to be uh, authored by uh, Euclid. In 1572, another student of uh, Ramus, Risner, published this edition of the optical works of Alhazen and Vitello, Opticae Tesaurus. In 1570, with this edition still unfinished, Ramus left Risner in Nuremberg and this was part of a deal with the goldsmiths Wenzel Jamnitzer and Hans Lenker. According to one of Ramus' earliest biographers, Lenker would only allow Ramus to see his perspective instruments if he left Risner in Nuremberg to teach him optics. And Lenker fulfilled his part of the deal by publishing Perspectiva in response to Ramus' request to explain to him how to construct the drawings in his Perspectiva Literaria. In this book, Lenker considered optics only as a mathematical art, 
in contrast to the understanding of objects held by others, such as natural philosophers. Um, so Lenko writes, although refined perspective is a high, beautiful, and subtle, though extensive art is those experienced in physics and in studying nature, and the stars surely know, being well versed in how to apply it even out to the heavenly bodies, I intend to work perspective, dear reader, in this my short work to be used only in the sense of an art that teaches by means of certain rules how to draw and form each thing on a plane or flat surface that would adhere to our sights and be seen. Lenker's definition of optics considered, consisted of one possible interpretation of the concept of mathematics and optics of Ramos and Risner. For Ramos, geometry was the art of measuring well, and the rules of an art were the rules for its practice. What did not contribute to practice had to be rejected. In a similar theme, Ramos and Risner defined optics as the art of seeing well. Ramos also offered his reader's professorship to reward the philosopher and mathematician who was able to meet his renowned plea for an astronomy without hypothesis. Ramus' challenge in Trivium Mathematicum followed his history of ancient astronomy, in which he attributed to the ancients the capacity to predict celestial phenomena without hypothesis. As to what Ramus meant by astronomy without hypothesis, the opinions of historians today diverse as much as those who took up this, the challenge in the 16th and 17th century. Two of Ramus' most recent commentators, Nick Jardine and Alain Sergon, have argued that Ramus rejected outright the quest for hidden causes prior to the phenomenon, and that he thought of astronomy without hypothesis as an historian and of its methods as geometrical measurement and an arithmetical calculation. However, they also note that Ramos does, on occasion, mention celestial physics, citing Ptolemy and Copernicus as sources of solid doctrine, which comports uneasily with the denial of all hidden causes of celestial phenomena. And the apparent wavering of Ramos' own position, or at least our uncertainty and that of his contemporaries about it, makes it difficult, nay impossible, to call what optics without hypothesis, something he envisioned in his testament would have meant to Ramos, or to estimate to what extent works on optics published in the years to come and within Ramos' sphere of influence qualified for this concept. Ramos had his hopes on Germany. He, said, he writes, why does there not rather arise from so many noble schools of Germany someone who is at once a philosopher and a mathematician to gain amidst eternal praise the prize that is Wego? Did the perspectiva which Lenka delivered upon Ramos' request offer a science of optics without hypothesis? It did, if Ramos' plea for without hypothesis was indeed intended as a denial of all causal hypotheses. Lenka limited his optics to the rules for its practice following in Ramos' footsteps, and he opposed his enterprise to, those of, to, do, uh, to that of uh, quote, those experienced in physics and in studying nature and the stars and the natural philosophers. Let uh, me turn now to Jean Pena, who published upon Ramos' request an edition of Euclid's Optics and Cryptoptics. Although Pena was familiar with the work of Whitley, who unequivocally accepted an intermissionist theory of vision, he wrote, Whitley was a man not inferior to Euclid in knowledge and erudition, as his work showed, but he had this weakness, common to all ages, to have preconceived opinions, which present themselves as demonstrations. As he states that vision takes place by reception of rays, however, this is not more necessary than if you would say that it happens by emission. In this book, Euclid clearly teaches that vision happens by rays proceeding from the eyes, to the visible objects. So Pena wavered between two positions. On the one hand, he declared that the question of the direction of the rays was irrelevant. Intermission was not necessarily more acceptable than extramission. The exclusion of this question from optics was in agreement with Ramos' concept of mathematics as limited to the rules of practice. It doesn't matter. And if Pena would have laughed at that, that he would have delivered an optics without a hypothesis to Ramos' satisfaction. However, in the sentence immediately following, he took sides with Euclid, pronouncing himself in favor of extramission. 
And this position did not reject outright hidden forces. If this was what Romans meant by without hypothesis. But, as I said, this is uncertain that this is in fact the meaning of without hypothesis. It would entail that, unlike Brahma's conception of ancient astronomy, ancient optics, so in uh, this case Euclid's, was not free of hypothesis. And so perhaps Painter's wavering between positions reflected his uncertainty, like that of many other mathematicians as astronomers in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, about Brahma's intended meaning of of without hypothesis. In any case, whether or not Pinnas' endorsement was at odds with Rama's intentions about an optics without hypothesis, it certainly was opposed to Kepler's interpretation of it, and I'll come to that in a minute. So how should we understand Pinnas' endorsement of extra mission if it was not for lack of knowledge of the perspectivist tradition of optics and Middle perspectiva in particular? And the point that I would like to make here is that perspective became so dominant in the mathematical arts of the 16th century that in the same process, optics increasingly was understood as perspective, so in the way that Lenke uh, defined the term. And against this background, for mid-16th century optician like Pena, extramission must have been an equally attractive alternative to intramission. Pena's position is similar to positions which we often encounter among those involved with perspective. It's well known that Leon Battista Alberti, in the first treatise on perspective, the Pictura, 1435, claimed the question of extramission versus intramission to be irrelevant for his purposes. Alberti writes, among the ancients, there was considerable dispute as to whether these rays emerged from the surface or from the eye, this truly difficult question, which is quite without value for our purposes, may here be set aside. But a similar attitude is still found more than a century later, uh, for example, in Daniele Barbaro's Practica della Perspectiva, published in 1568. The most interesting example of, of how those involved with perspective dealt with the question of the direction of the rays comes from Pena's contemporary, Jamnitzer, one of the mathematicians, besides Lenke, whom Ramas and Risner visited on their German tour. In contrast to Alberti, Jamnitzer endorsed extramission instead of declaring the question irrelevant for its purposes. In Perspectiva Corporum Regularium, Jamnitzer argued that Perspectiva is, quote, an art which teaches the quality, kind, and nature of lines and the flux which is projected to and from for our side to, to other things. And so this is an extramission theory, presumably of Platonic origin, appropriately in a book. Uh, of drawings of the platonic regular bodies. Although Pena never saw Jamnitz's work, he was closely associated with such mathematicians, indirectly through his teacher Ramas, and more directly was in doubt in his writings to the rhetoric and the utility of the mathematical arts. Pena's defense of the utility of optics in the Uso Opticets was a strong echo of the Nuremberg tradition of perspective initiated by Albrecht Dürer. In the preface to this work, Dürer claimed that his Unterweisung der Messung was profitable for all those who desired to know better their art, not only painters, but also goldsmiths, sculptors, and stonecutters, carpenters, and all those who lead to measure. In the Uso Optichet, Pena also defended the utility of optics on the basis of the wide applicability of optical knowledge to a whole range of mathematical arts. A mathematician like Pena only endorsed Euclidean extramissionism associated with the theory of the mathematical arts practices by making a distinction between his role as a mathematician on the one hand and as a natural philosopher on the other. The Italian mathematician Ignazio Danti expressed this strategic move most explicitly in the preface to his edition in Italian translation of Euclid's optics, optical works in 1573. This edition was based on the Euclidean text as established by Pena, and his preface was nothing else but a paraphrase of Pena's De Uso Opticets. Dante argued that as a, as a mathematician, he could not but assume extramissionism. So he writes, we as mathematicians assume the principles of Euclid and we should follow his opinion and the opinion of Plato, his master, to which adhere all the mathematicians of antiquity. Now, Dante was explicit that he was speaking as a mathematician, 
not as a natural philosopher. In fact, when Dante spoke as a natural philosopher in his commentary on Vignola's Dewey Regole, he endorsed an intermission theory within a broader Aristotelian natural philosophical framework on vision and light. The disciplinary distinction between mathematics and natural philosophy is at play here. And the strategic move of Dante consisted of accepting the natural philosophical assumptions of the ancient mathematicians when he spoke as their fellow mathematician, while embracing the contradictory Aristotelian natural philosophical assumptions on vision and light when he spoke as a natural philosopher. And this discipline strategy was not acceptable to Kaplan. In a letter of October 1597 to his former teacher, Michael Meskin, Kaplan jokingly claimed Ramos Price, the Regis Professorship at Paris, on the basis of the recently published Mysterium Cosmographicum. In his explanation of why he was entitled to it, Kepler gave his interpretation of Ramos' astronomy without hypothesis. And this interpretation did not necessarily agree with Ramos' intentions, but it was one, as Kepler showed, Ramos left open. If Ramos wants exterminated hypotheses, which do believe are postulated, not proved, and if he praises that astronomy without hypothesis, which is content with the apparatus of celestial orbs, of nature alone, as indeed after he seems altogether to imply, then I, or Copernicus, or both together have won, and the Ramian professorship is owed to us. If, on the other hand, Ramus altogether rejects all hypotheses, whether true and natural or false, then he is what I said above, namely a fool, and that I think in your judgment too. Truly, to preserve the honour of both of us, I prefer to call myself Regis Professor rather than Ramos the Fool. A decade later, he again claimed the prize, then, or uh, this time, on the basis of his Astronomia Nova. He reminded Ramos, and in fact interpreted him as saying that astronomy cannot do without true hypotheses, without knowledge of the true causes, or without Physics. You request help for the magnificent science only from logic and mathematics, he wrote. I ask you not to exclude physics, which it can in no way do without. What would be absurd, Kepler continued, was to attempt to build a science of false causes along the lines of what Osiander intended in his preface to Copernicus. According to Kepler, much against Copernicus' own intentions, since Copernicus, quote, considered his hypothesis to be true no less than those ancients of yours, or Ramesses, considered theirs and philosophized, which you required in an astronomer. Kepler then had Ramus saying that what was to be avoided in astronomy were false natural philosophical assumptions. If this was what Ramos meant by astronomy without hypothesis, Kepler could not agree more. An astronomer had to philosophize in order to be a good astronomer. Kepler's interpretation of Ramos' astronomy without hypothesis also informed his views of the relation between optics and natural philosophy, as it surfaced in Kepler's critique of Penas de Uso Opticets. And Kepler delivered this critique in the preface to his Diopterche, published in 1611. He praised Benar for his willingness to apply optical knowledge to find out about the physical constitution of the heavens, instances in which Benar often corrected Aristotelian doctrine. But he also criticized the passage in which Benar endorsed the Euclidean extramissions theory of vision. Quote, Bittler has stated that vision happens by the reception of rays, Kepler began his critique, and I have proven this by most evident experiences. Penner's endorsement of extremitionism, Kepler continued, was not proper to philosophical study. And Kepler rewrote the passage from Penner on this issue, which I've already shown, substituting Euclid's name where Penner had Wittler's. So I so it means pen up. Now, do not want a physics which is easily believed and which, because of this experientially, tests optical demonstrations which Euclid 
uh, he himself, so Pena says, Witterlow, and other opticians who only believe what they have seen demonstrated by themselves have accurately examined. Euclid was a man not inferior to anyone else in knowledge and erudition, as his work showed, but he had this weakness, common to all ages, to have preconceived opinions, which present themselves as demonstrations. Thus he states that vision takes place by rays proceeding from the arts to the visible thing. However, this is no more necessary than if you would say that it happens by the reception of rays. And so the claim in the last sentence was completely unacceptable to Kepler. Kepler pointed out that indeed for some demonstrations, also in his own work, in this case the Oprache, the direction of the rays was irrelevant. In particular, Kepler admitted in his discussion of the deception of visions, one was inclined to talk as if rays proceeded from the eye. But his conclusion left no doubt as to his own position on the issue. He writes, in reality, there are receptions of rays in the eye. Kepler consi therefore considered Pena's strategic move on the relation between mathematics and natural philosophy, which consisted of accepting the natural philosophical assumptions of the ancients when speaking as a mathematician unacceptable. It was not the fact that Pena accepted for true natural philosophical assumptions that followed Kepler. What he found unacceptable in Pena's strategy was that Pena knowingly accepted false natural philosophical assumptions. And Kepler's critique fully agreed with his interpretation of Rama's view of mathematical science without hypothesis. The problem is not the hypothesis. Quite the contrary, a mathematician doing astronomy or optics has to philosophize to be a good mathematician, but to build a mathematical science on knowingly false hypotheses or knowingly false natural philosophical insights. Kepler's critique of Pena's De Musa Opticas was only published in 1611, but it is evident that he considered his Paragomena Fidelionum of 1604 to qualify as optics without hypothesis, just like he taught his Mysterium Cosmographicum or Astronomia Nova as astronomy without hypothesis. In fact, the claim in his critique that he had proven that vision happened by the reception of rays by most evident experiments can only refer to the uh, Paragomena, and more particular to the common experiences with crystal balls and aqueous globes to demonstrate the working of the crystalline lens in chapter 5. The Paragomena then was Kepler's work as a natural philosopher on optics. Kepler describes the common experiences of uh, image formation in a crystal ball, which were based on Delaporte's secrets, in the following way. So he's kind of rewording what he has read in Delaporte. For if one were to stand with a crystalline or aqueous globe of this kind in some room next to a glazed window and provide a wide piece of paper behind the globe distant from the edge of the globe by a semi-diameter of the globe, the glazed window with the channels overlapped with wood and lead are depicted with perfect clarity upon the paper within an inverted position. The rest of the objects do the same thing if the place be darkened a little more. Whatever things are able to reach through the breadth of the little window or opening to the globe are all depicted with perfect clarity and most pleasingly through the crystalline upon the paper opposite. And while the picture, Gabriel's pictura, appears at this distance uniquely, that is, a semi-diameter from the globe to the paper, and nearer and farther there is confusion, nevertheless, exactly the opposite happens when the eye is applied. For if the eye be sat at a semi-diameter of the globe behind the glass, where formerly the picture was most distant, there now appears the greatest confusion of the objects represented through the glass. If the eye comes to be nearer to the globe, it perceives the objects opposite erect and large. If it, on the other hand, recedes farther from the globe than the semi-diameter of the globe, it grasps the objects with distinct images inverted in situation and small and clinging right to the nearest surface of the globe. Now, De La Porta did not mind this combined description of the geometry of burning and perception properties. Kepler's urge to work on optics as a natural philosopher made him try to make sense of this experiment within his physics of light. 
Kepler's theory of light, as David Lindbergh has argued, expressed a deep and abiding commitment to Neoplatonic emanationism. And his views on the nature of visible light were deeply embedded in a theological metaphysics. Kepler considered light as the offspring of sphericity, and both light and sphericity as images of the Trinity. The center of the sphere was God, the circumference represented Christ, and the intervening space, the Holy Spirit. The theological metaphysics provided Kepler with a metaphysical foundation of the rectilinear propagation of light and of the straight line along which light was propagated, the ray. According to Kepler, a ray was a geometrical line representing the motion of light. He also attached an appendix to chapter 1, and that's the significant chapter 1 in which he, in fact, attacks the Aristotelian theory of light and vision, and more in particular, attacks the Aristotelian notion that light is a state of the potentially transparent medium. Instead, Kepler maintained that light was an emanation from a luminous body and that it did not depend on a medium for its existence. Light was incor incorporeal, the two-dimensional geometrical surface without matter, weight, or resistance. Kepler then did not claim that light could be described mathematically, but that the very nature of light was mathematical. In his description of his common experiences, this led him to draw a careful distinction between what the eye can see and what is projected at a certain locus. That's the way he's rephrasing it, teleport is secret here. At the locus of the point of combustion, an image is projected on a piece of paper. But when the eye is placed at this very same locus, it will only see confusion. And this led him to criticize Delaporte's experiment producing images in the air which were based on the lack of distinction between what the eye can see and what is projected. And so this is, again, Kepler speaking. Pertinent to this is what Porter had taught in chapter 10, proceeding with a convex crystalline lens to see an image hanging in the air. This is the same, in a sense, same image hanging in the air already in the 13th century Secretum Philosophorum. For this reason, he adds, if you will place a piece of paper in the way, you will see clearly that a lighted candle appears to be burning upon the paper. That is, the image will be seen weakly and hardly at all in the bare air itself, by Porter's admission. But if you put a piece of paper in the way, if I say you interpose a piece of paper between the lens and the sense of vision, for with me, Porter here is still speaking about the image, to the imago, not yet about the picture, the pictura, of which this is true, as will be clear below. The image will now appear not hanging in the air, but fixed on the paper. For the paper, striking the eyes more obviously, studies them on the place of the image, so that they may be turned towards each other in that direction. And nonetheless, because the paper is then brighter than the image, the paper will be seen primarily, the image secondarily. For it is not mathematical dimensions alone that create the image, but also much more the colors and lights and physical causes. So Kepler's appropriation of Delaporte's secret was mediated by his views on the nature of light. No longer only interested, like Delaporte, in manipulating lenses and mirrors to create optical effects, Kepler developed a new theory of optical imagery, distinguishing, as in his rewriting of Delaporte's secret, a distinction between imago and pictura. So well, let me conclude. So I've investigated how the culture of books of secrets that Laporta lived in and helped to create shaped his optics. Secrets were tools for the transmission of optics, but the organization and structure of books of secrets also significantly transformed optical knowledge. Secrets decontextualized and repackaged optical knowledge in how to bits. And this made optical knowledge travel more easily and made it reach larger audiences of readers in the 16th century than ever before. Given the structure of books of secrets, these readers were also invited to try and test optical uh, recipes, and they did. The reader's experience was not always disassociated from the world of making and doing. 
We have the structure of books of secrets, also created conceptual ambiguity. Exceptional readers like to have solved in the process of appropriating Delaporte's experiments, placing them in a different, disciparate framework. And while this, at least to me, has obvious relevance for the history of optics, I hope that, as in this process, secrets were turned into common experiences, as Kepler called them, it also has wider significance for the history of experience and experiment. Thank you very much. see him, the kind of tools, conceptual tools that are in there, the kind of methods, like for example something like the Catetus rule, which was used over and over again to determine the locus of an image, you see him apply this over and over again, fully uh, um, convergent with the conceptual framework of perspectivist optics, absolutely to the limits to where it actually, you see that in a later manuscript in 1618 in the Telescopy, which was never published. So it's absolute limits where it breaks down. You see him try this. So there is this optical theory behind it, but he's never 
interested in, um, in the nature of light. So this never becomes an issue. And that's, it's, there's never a theory of light really there. And it's, I think, for De La Porta, it's something that, in the end, as for many other uh, mathematicians in the 16th century, it's something that, I think, in the end, is just not something that was of interest to him. It's not his aim to deliver a theory of light. He does not need to communicate it. And I don't think, in the end, he really had a theory of light in any um, you know, um, uh, organized, structured way. I mean, there might be confused notions for things that he picked up from reading the perspectivist tradition of optics, reading of perhaps Roger Bacon, for example, where this is still present, mm -hmm. and where he uses notions of species in very you know, loose, loose ways and things like that. But he never has a, a, a well-conceived theory of right, and he's just not interested. In it, I think in the end, because he's really interested in creating experiments which has a diversity of optical effects, and that's basically what he wants. What he wants to do, and you don't need a theory of light for this purpose. Um, but you do need a theory of the formation of the yeah. image. You do need a theory and of formation of the image. perhaps even some form of the theory of vision. Or you think that he was? No, smart. you definitely need some form. That's why I said so. He's kind of gesturing at notions, also using notions from from the tradition, like species, which he's using, but in a very um, very loose way. I mean, anyone who's uh, who's, who's actually studied space in the context of the 13th century, uh, of the 13th century work of of, of Bacon or Whitlow or whatever, would say, that, "What's what's he doing? Uh, this is very this is very loose." And um, I think this is kind of characteristic. It's not not a coincidence because in the end, it doesn't look, it does not really matter for his purposes. While uh, I mean, it does not really matter what kind of theory you hold of lights according to him, to locate, to create a particular optical effect. Mm -hmm. He finds it irrelevant, I think, for his purposes. And so that's the, so he has a, definitely a theory of image formation, a very clear one, very well conceived, but he does not have a theory of light, as far as I see. He has this, this loose notions. And it's not just, it's just not interesting, it's not like this. But then just to move one step forward, apart from Kepler, yeah. the other examples that you've shown, don't have a theory of the nature of light. They do have only a theory of the image formation and, uh, I mean, the intuition or exclamation. And, and also for them, it's not necessarily, you they don't need to have such a, such a very background metaphysical theory about what the light is, um, I don't know, they do materiat or materiat. I think as soon as you try to define what a ray is in optics, mm -hmm. you actually get into into a theory of light. There is no there is no way of escaping that discussion. I mean, you can define it in very general ways, but in principle, if you really want to do this properly, you have to deal with the nature of light. And I think that someone, I think Ignazio Dante, in that sense, is a very nice example because you see him actually take two positions depending on the kind of publication, the kind of role he defines for himself. And so in Vignola, as the regular, he's absolutely explicitly endorsing an Aristotelian theory of vision and an Aristotelian uh, theory of light, both. And they seem to be somehow tied together. And this is something that you see with Dante, but that you would see uh, with very few mathematicians at the time. Mm -hmm. But something that you would see quite commonly, and something that I left out on purpose completely, in uh, the whole Anton tradition of the 16th century. So there you would find this combination strictly, especially in the part of the context. So if you would go into uh, the work of, for example, uh, Fabrizio da Papandente uh, on the, the medical side, or, you would, or the anatomical side, or you would go on the philosophical side in the work of Sabahela, his work on vision, you would actually see both things at the same time. And for them, th this is a real, real issue. And the point is that it is not for most of these mathematicians. With few exceptions, like Ignazio Dante, where it just becomes explicit what is actually how they define their own role. But otherwise, it's kind of silent. Mm -hmm. It's just not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Yeah, yeah, so Kepler has both in the public domain as well in the optician. It has uh, diagrams which pretty much goes with every single proposition. Uh, so uh, he does not have secrets. He does not, mm -hmm. well, he does. I, I'll come to that in a minute. He, he does not, uh, it's interesting, uh, I think. Uh, uh, so in the public domain, he only has propositions and actions, etc. Uh, so, and almost, I mean, every single proposition goes comes with at least one diagram. Uh, it's interesting as such because sometimes he seems to take diagrams which come uh, directly, for example, uh, uh, from um, uh, Della Potes de Refractione and then actually reinterprets the diagram. Which is interesting as such. It seems like the diagram plays like the leading role, and then the interpretation comes 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 later. Um, but it does have. Um, and so, uh, for Kepler, this is absolutely uh, it's essential. I think that he's not uh, he's not doing something spectacular there. I think this is very much what you would see any mathematician do in this particular uh, time. Um, he does have secrets, not in the Pari Pomena at Italiano, but in the Diopteri. That he has, it's not called secrets, it's something that um, he would define, uh, he defines as cryptic instruments. And he has a whole section of cryptic instruments, uh, which very much function and are described in ways as, um, for example, this could, this could come directly in principle from the Cyclic Philosophy. Uh, if you would not know that this could, came from the Optry chain, you would probably not recognize it. Uh, and there he, he often he does not have any diagrams, so it's just it's just a, a, a kind of textual description, as you would often also see in books of secrets uh, and uh, and recipe collections. There are no diagrams, and it's often difficult to uh, to find out what actually what the instrument is actually attached. I mean, the most famous example of a, a cryptic instrument is something that we now all know as the astronomical telescope. Which is uh, often seen as, uh, it's often described as Capes Diopteriche as that's the book in which he offers uh, the alternative to the Galilean telescope, which consisted of a convex uh, objective and a concave eyepiece. Kepler has a convex eyepiece and an uh, objective. And so it's often said that Kepler kind of proposes that as, as the, the big alternative with the whole theoretical insight behind it. It's not, it's, it's been. This only happens, it's never called a telescope, but it's just one of, of uh, I think, ten or so in total cryptic instruments. Sort of secrets would be my closest <coughs> interpretation, but perhaps there are other. Uh, 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 sorry, let me just push you again in modern terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the you know, the, the first kind of reaction of a modern reader would be to say, here are these things that are traveling, uh, earlier historiography of science, if you call them facts, you don't like the word facts, it's one of secrets. Uh, and that, as you said, the very nice characteristic of secrets is that they are definitely ambiguous, mm -hmm. otherwise they wouldn't be secrets. Okay, and some, some of them are oral and disambiguated, which means basically that they were tried. And Kepler understood how to do it, and therefore integrated in a theory. But he took some that didn't work, mm -hmm. and they remain as the, so that the form of the secret was kept for those mm -hmm. who either didn't work, right. or he didn't try, or he tried but didn't know how to explain. But he mm -hmm. just put them there mm -hmm. for others to disambiguate. Let's say. What, what possible? Yeah, this is this is absolutely possible. Um, and it's very well. So some of some of these things we, we now understand quite quite clearly. Uh, for example, the astronomical telescope is, is, is the clearest example, which was immediately picked up by uh, by, by Shiner, etc., and then put into a whole theoretical uh, framework. Others uh, are much more difficult to um, um, to explain. Others are definitely borrowed. So they. So teleported secrets, for example, to create a candle watch light is a cryptic instrument in Kepler's the Optician. Um, and so yeah, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that he is quite consciously actually borrowing a particular form because he knows this is going to work in a particular sense. And that he hopes that he creates a, a particular readership in a way, also for his book. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry, I'm um, continuing the discussion. Um, about this ambiguity that you talk about, trying to figure out exactly what you mean by, or if you could explain a bit more what you mean by this ambiguity of, of, of these examples. It, uh, I thought you talked about the ambiguity of examples once they're taken out of the original context. Mm -hmm. And I thought you meant um, ambiguity occurs or once a, an experimental instance is um, divorced, separated from a larger um, natural philosophical explanatory account. Uh, but apparently such natural philosophical background did not exist uh, and often did not, you're saying. Then what exactly makes for the ambiguity? How do you? Yeah, it's not. It so it definitely has to do with uh, with uh, what I would say decontextualization, and so it's the decontextualization that I think creates the ambiguity. It's not necessarily a natural philosophical framework which is lacking. It might be the context. Uh, I mean, a purely geometrical or mathematical context, which is lacking, and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the best example, I still, or a good example, is I think still the, the image in the air, which I showed. So in the original context, in Mittelow's, um, in Mittelow's Perspectiva, this is one proposition in one particular book, which comes with a diagram. And it's basically what Mittelow means by in the air is actually that the image, if you follow the geometrical construction, it is outside the mirror and geometrical space. And this becomes very clear once you actually have the whole, when you actually see it inside the proposition, it's immediately clear that what Whitlow does not mean is that it is in a sort of experimentally produced image which is really floating in the air. It really means outside the mirror in geometrical space, not in physical uh, space. And so once that demonstration, because then that secret is actually from the in the secret of philosophy, but pretty much everywhere. I've written one article on the ubiquity of images in the air. They're actually they're everywhere in the 15th and 16th century, from books on military fortification to uh, I mean, name it. They're images in the air. They're even images of images in the air. You, Giovanni Fontana is a physician. Uh, who wrote a book on, on uh, military engineering, who actually showed a beautiful image of a magic lantern and then an image in the air, which is created floating in the air, projected magically by this, uh, by this, by this lantern. And so they completely take it out of contact and they call images in the air. And then that concept, which has no longer anything to do with um, uh, the original context, the geometrical purposes for which it derives, creates a life of its own and they start to get all kinds of interpretations of what that might be and all kinds of secrets or, or tricks are developed to create these images and then you get someone eventually like Kepler who uh, tries to reinterpret this and makes, tries to make physically sense of this. And so that's, that's the kind of ambiguity, it's the decontextualization that creates that ambiguity, that's what I mean by ambiguity. That's interesting because it means this ambiguation did not depend on, on physical theory, let alone on a metaphysical theory. It, it could be just a function of being clear about the, um, the premises of your, of your um, discussion, which can be geometrical, and then that's it. Yes, in principle, yes. So this is why I said the disambiguation. So I see disambiguation in connection with doing it. So if you do it yourself, and that's actually very interesting, uh, the diagram business, okay? So the, the appearance yeah. of the diagram in okay. the middle of the recipe would be the equivalent of, I have tried this, this is how it should look for myself. Well, um, there are many diagrams. I'm thinking now of the cases in which Porta himself is introducing diagrams, like in the separation of water and wine, where you have a, a diagram of showing not, not all, so it's not an experiment, it's just adding what kind of geometrical, how, how should it look yeah. if you start doing it yourself? I think, I think uh, um, 
this is true in part. I not completely agree uh, because there. I mean, completely agree for the very simple reason that there are diagrams in the Laporte's Natural Magic, uh, also in Book 17, which is mostly about the optical effects, which he actually borrows from elsewhere, and have nothing like the uh, Orphine diagram, which he just borrows, which has nothing to do with trying it yourself. You just borrowed, you just uh, borrowed from elsewhere. But, not even in that case, given. But give, not from Book of Secrets. Not from a book of secrets in that in that case, yeah. Um, uh, but it's definitely, I think, I follow, completely follow the point that, especially I think even more in the refraction, which is a, that he's using diagrams to actually describe optical effects, and so he, he molds these diagrams in ways that he can actually just describe what what he has tried out mm -hmm. and the kind of effects that he gets, and then. But there's an interpretation falling from that, and, and it, from once he has a diagram. So in that case, it it, it does. But I would I would uh, refrain from saying that decontextualization in general can only take place by trying it out. Mm -hmm. I do think that that is not. I mean, it can only be qualified in the case of Kantian. Um, that's actually what I wanted to respond to, the, uh, to the, or add it to the last question. There is one case in the public domain which is very similar to a cryptic instrument. And that's um, a very similar experience that you see here of creating an image in the air, which he normally always denies. But in that case, he says, well, it can be done. Because I've seen it created uh, in one particular case in the Dresden Kunsthammer in 1600s with a crystal ball, which we can in fact identify. And that's, and then it's done. But so, and, and it plays a role in the kind of, of, of uh, this ambiguation of, uh, of this concept in the year. But um, it's not something that he has tried out himself. It's something that he has at best that he has observed. And he quite very much stresses that it's something that he has observed by coincidence, mm -hmm. by accident. Uh, and then in the end, of course, it, it's a, that it is a game, etc., which mm -hmm. gives it a particular preternatural pre status, I think, in these kind of images. So it's not, it's not necessarily always by doing it to yourself that, you, that, you, that the disambiguation takes place. Because Kepler, in the end, um, is not so much about doing it yourself. He's very rarely doing it himself, at least in the way he writes. Mm -hmm. I started, actually, I started working on on Kepler as an as an, an experiment because there is this long tradition of speaking uh, about Kepler as someone who never experiments, who is never involved in any uh, in any experimentation. Well, then, if you actually look at what he's what he's writing. There is lots of experiments and lots of experiences in it. And so I started to try to make sense of the different kinds of experiences and experiments and the different <coughs> ways of writing them. And I must say that the kind of things that he, the, you can actually say, well, this is, he has uh, uh, done himself in, this, in the sense that you might, uh, you know, this kind of personal engagement is in terms of, of, of relatively small. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe then we should suggest that doing yourself in the terms of hands-on experimentation right. with trying to understand, trying not to understand yourself. So the kind right. of thing that you take a, a secret and you start thinking not as much as what are the causes uh, or what's the explanation of it, but mm -hmm. how it works. Mm -hmm. And then trying to explain how it works right. is a sort of, okay, you don't do it with hands, but you right. do it as an imaginary experiment. Right, I think that as a general driving question, mm -hmm. that is in, is very much what Kepler also is after. And then the, that in the end becomes about causes is the second after thought. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the second after that the Laporte never had. Because for him it was only about getting to make it work as mm -hmm. far as I understand it. And yes, there are all kinds of optical notions and theories behind this, but it never becomes an issue. It's my. Uh, it's about getting it to work, mm -hmm. and then having a diagram describing what kind of effects you can have. And on that basis, you might get an interpretation. You might get a certain geometry functioning, 
but it's not the bad, it's not the bad cause. I think that's for me, as far as I see, is that's the distinction. That's, uh, I think, a Holy Spirit, so you have this serenity, and that's the kind of the, the, let's say, the metaphysical uh, foundation for rectilinear propagation of so light, and that's what it was. Some kind of attempt to define the nature of light. Yeah, this is an attempt for him to define the nature of light, uh, saying in the end that the nature of light is really is mathematical. So it's not that the ray describes um, uh, light, it's really that the nature of light is mathematical as such. He was so and it's, with this. Yeah, and it's it's and if you try to then as a human being or a mathematician try to figure out what you uh, what that is, you're basically reading the mind of God. That's I think the core of what he's saying. And that solved for him a whole bunch of problems which then later on, for example, Descartes had, had much more trouble. Uh, to solve, but this makes for capture makes things also in a sense simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's relative. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I'm two more small questions. Okay. Questions about genres this time. Okay. Um, the example of the secret and close of forum is um, quite remarkable. I didn't know that. It's in, um, my question is, is First of all, how unique is this format? Is there are there other examples that follow the um, model of the seven liberal arts and and introduce um, uh, such recipes, or secrets, or is this a unique example? And and how does it, does this text work? Does it follow a more traditional, conventional format and introduce secrets, or is it just uh, recipes, or it's just a collection of recipes that is, you know, just given um, formally, just uh, uh, formally the name of, of the um, of the liberal arts. That, that's one question, and, and the other question is: um, Is there any traffic between books of secrets in um, the problemata literature at all? And if so, is it significant? Um, uh, start with the last uh, question um, a bit, but not that much. So some of some of the uh, some of the problems actually return also as secrets, um, but I haven't really you know studied this in any detail. So I, but, um, it's very much possible that there is a much larger uh, traffic between these things than I at first sight would say. Yes, this is. Could be more, but it's not obviously possible. the purpose of the problematic is very different. Yeah. Pedagogical. Right. Aristotelian right. conception. Right. Um, and um, yeah, the sort of things that you could borrow from the problemata are within the whole range of books of secrets is relatively limited. I mm. think in terms of things that we try to mm. achieve or do. So that's, uh, that's not, so I, I think what I've said, very much focusing on these optical things is, is of course a bit distorting what this whole tradition of books of secrets and recipes is, is, really, is really about, so it's, it's going through its yeah. very, very particular angle and so from that perspective I can fully see why you would then also try to make a connection to the problem, which is in principle possible. But yeah, it's something that I should do, yeah, I should, I should do more work on. 
Um, then um, uh, the question of genre. The, uh, so what the Secreto Philosophorum is, is really a collection of recipes, um, which is then organized into the structure of the seven liberal arts. Um, this is, as far as I know, is the only, um, the only collection of recipes which is organized in that particular way. I don't know of any other example which uses the several liberal arts to organize a, a collection of recipes. There are all kinds of other organizing quite, principles at right, work, yeah. and those are very interesting to study as such because they reveal all, sometimes also all kinds of classificatory issues. Um, uh, so you, s you start seeing, for example, books on, uh, for example, tying recipes in the 17th century being organized according to classifications of color. Uh, for example, these kind of, and that's that's of course that's very interesting. Because you get a grip on on color concepts in that particular uh, period. Uh, so you have these um, you have these organizational principles because most of these recipe collections, uh, at least up to uh, really the wave uh, of books of secrets imprint also in the 16th century, are uh, keep this in mind, uh, are not produced in. Uh, in artisanal workshops as such, but very much mostly in monastic contexts, which of course could also have workshops or illumination, for example, and things like that, but it's very much in that context. And so many of the, in fact, most, uh, most famous collections that we know, like Theophilus, the Artis uh, Diversibus, uh, of the 12th century, so it's to this 12th century monk, mm -hmm. comes with a whole, um, Traffics about the status and the status of the um, mechanical arts. And so that's often a context um, for the, uh, the publication, but for writing down these recipes. So my sense is that what the Creative Philosophy Forum does is in the end, although it's never really made explicit in the Creative Philosophy Forum, but by organizing things like how to make a pen and how to write and how to create inks is to actually make a claim about the status of the mechanical arts by forcing them into the framework of the liberal arts. And that this is what is going on here. Um, is a, I, I would say is, is the most likely poss possibility. The other people would say, well, the Green Fields of Form was really, really uh, uh, produced in a university context. Uh, it's produced probably in an Oxford college. As a joke. As a joke. Possibly. As a joke. Right. Yeah. Um, that's also a possible possibility. Um, I think mean, both it, might be possible know. at the same time. We don't know for sure. We but we know. don't. We don't know for sure. We just know that the, that the oldest uh, copy that we have is from around 1300 and is English. Um, <coughs> it's in, uh, so it's in Latin, but it's uh, it's it's definitely clarified and still I think in a, uh, I think in an Oxford college uh, college library. Mm -hmm. But from then on, it's it's spreading out. I mean, you find them uh, from uh, from Poland to to Spain uh, in bits and parts. So there are many many of these manuscripts uh, around in very very different geographical contexts. But what the original purpose was is. which is on, behind uh, the store. We will be walking there, so if you want to come join us. But first, uh, let us thank our speaker tonight.